I would like to buy the book of Acts, chapter 17. And this morning, we're going to get through the first 21 verses of that chapter. And then I'm going to close out uh, this morning's message with a uh, some uh, truth from the book of Ecclesiastes. We're actually going to cho- uh, close out with what uh, I've what we call the doctrine of the crooked stick. And we're going to get to that at the end. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to have a few moments of silent prayer. This is your opportunity to make your own way with the Lord if you need to. And then I'll close this out and we'll begin our study. So let's pray. Father, I ask that you would use me as a tool and an instrument this morning to teach the truth. I pray, Father, that God, the Holy Spirit, would guide and direct my words and my thoughts. Lord, you know what a weak vessel I am. And I'm just so thankful, Father, that uh, for this opportunity, once again, uh, to teach the Word of God. I uh, ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 17. So in this chapter, uh, describes Paul's ministry in three different cities and how some of the people in those cities responded to the Word of God. Uh, these are pictures or snapshots, if you will, instead of like a mural or a painting, it's a snapshot of the response of the gospel to these uh, different cities. Uh, as we study these three different responses, we can certainly see our modern world and better understand what to expect as we seek to witness for Christ today. Because the things that we see, the responses that we're going to see in these three cities are the same responses that we see uh, all over the world in the present time. But these three different cities with three different responses to the gospel. First, there is Thessalonica, which resists the gospel. Uh, Then there's the city of Berea, which accepts the gospel. And then there's the city of Athens, which ridicules the gospel. And on any given day, whether an individual or a group, you're going to run into one of these three responses. And by the way, in each one of these cities, not everybody doesn't believe. There are some people who believe in Thessalonica. And there actually are some people who end up believing in the city of Athens. But for the most part, we're going to see these three general responses. We're going to see rejection in the city of Thessalonica, belief in Berea, and then ridicule in the city of Athens. So with that in mind, let's read the first nine verses of chapter 17. It says, Now when they had traveled through Amphiopolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where, uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence uh, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released him. So here we have the first city, which is Thessalonica. And I would have you note in verse 1 the pronoun they. And this indicates that Luke is no longer with them. We saw in the other chapter where Luke said we. And because Luke was a part of the party, now he's not there. And it's just Paul and Silas and Timothy. And so they leave Philippi and head southwest along the coast through Amphiopolis, Apollonia, and end up in Thessalonica. Now, Amphiopolis was, in those days, it was called Nine Ways, which suggests it's important both strategically and commercially. You see, most cities at that time were built on a square pattern, uh, a lot like they are today. If you've ever been in Arizona, or uh, those, all the cities out there are, are built on a square pattern, and that's kind of how it was in most cities at that time. But this particular city, um, uh, it's a hard one to say, Amphiopolis, it was actually built kind of in, in like a round, like a, a roundhouse, if you will. Uh, and there were nine different uh, roads that intersected in the city. And so they called it Nine Ways. 
uh, it was an important station on the Roman road known as the Via Ignatia or the Ignatian Way. And this road was used as a trade route and also by the Roman army. And Paul and company traveled through the city on their way to Apollonia, also on the Ignatian Way. And then 38 miles beyond that is Thessalonica. And now Thessalonica was an inland seaport. Now the city was located at the confluence, uh, the, the, the uh, intersection, if you will, of three rivers, uh, all of which flowed to the sea. Therefore, it was an inland seaport. Uh, Thessalonica was a Roman colony and therefore an important city. Uh, it was founded, the city was, in 316 B.C. by Cassander. And after the death, if you remember, of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided amongst four generals, uh, and they, these generals were Lysimachus, Seleucus, uh, Seleucus, Ptolemy, and Cassander. So Cassander is the one that gets that portion of, the, of, the, uh, of, of uh, Alexander's empire in which the city of Thessalonica is, which is, you know, that's Macedon, Greek. So this is where we are, and so Cassander names his city, uh, named it after his wife, who was named Thessaloniki. So he calls it Thessalonica. In 168 BC, the Romans conquered the city and made it a, the capital of Greece. And by the time of Paul, its prominence had diminished, but it was still a vital city in the Roman Empire. Thessalonica today is the modern city of Salonica. You can find it on a map. It's right there on the coast uh, near, near the city of Athens. But the fact that the city was on a major Roman highway, think of an interstate today, right? Did you know, that you probably knew this already, but interstates were actually created for the military. Uh, and then the reason why, if we were ever attacked, the military could have the, use the interstates to get anywhere in the country. And it was kind of the same way with the Roman roads. It was kind of the same principle. So it was on a trade route. Uh, and this is the reason why we're told in verse 1 that there was a, Jew, a Jewish synagogue there. Uh, so in both Thessalonica and Berea, the missionary team will go first to the Jews. We see that in verse 1. But now in verses uh, 2 through 4, we're told that on, uh, on three Sabbaths, they go to the synagogue to give the gospel. And some of the people, including Greeks and leading women of the city, they hear and respond and believe. And in verse 4, I want us to see there, there's a template, if you will, of five different words uh, that kind of, um, uh, well, actually verses two and three, uh, and also four. There, there's five different words that kind of give us a template of giving the gospel. Read with me again verse two. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Five things I want us to see in here that we could use as a template to give the gospel. And number one is the word custom as found in verse two. According to Paul's custom, that word means habits or the usual way that somebody does something. Paul therefore had a pattern that he used depending on his audience when he would give the gospel. He would adjust how and what he said. For example, when he would give the gospel to the Jews, he would start with the Old Testament scriptures and come forward through the scriptures proving that Jesus is the Christ. And when it came to the Greeks or, or other Gentiles, a lot of times he would actually go back to creation, okay, all the way back to the creation, and then he would prove the existence of God and also of Christ from that standpoint. In fact, when we get to uh, the, the city of Athens, Paul's going to use that very thing. He's going to go back to creation when he speaks to the Greeks. But the fact of the matter is, he had a set pattern. He had a way that he did things, a custom, when it came to giving the gospel. Then we see the word reasoned. And he went to them, and for three Sabbaths, reason. Uh, and the word means to revolve in the mind, to think about it in your head, to teach with the method of question and answer. To give a discourse and note that Paul, the things that, he, that where he directs them, what he gets them to do to turn over in their mind, it says, and according to Paul's custom, he would reason with them from where? From the scriptures. He goes to the Bible. Uh, he does not base what he says on his opinion. Okay? Man, I'll tell you what, there, you really see this a lot today. Uh, a lot of Bible teachers, they give you your, their opinion on something. And that's supposed to be the truth. That's not what Paul did. Paul always went to the scriptures. 
And he built and based his reasoning arguments from the word of God. <coughs> Next we see the word in verse 3, explaining. And this word means to open, to open the sense of a thing, to explain and to expound. And as he opens and teaches the scriptures, he explains what it means. Isn't that amazing? That's how you give the gospel. All right? So therefore, you know what? The better you know your Bible, the better off you're going to be. Right? Then we have the fourth word, the word evidence in verse 3. It says, verse 3, explaining and giving evidence. And this word means to set or lay before, to propound, to deposit, to commit to the charge of, to entrust. He has followed his custom, his habit, of reasoning and explaining the scriptures, and now he reaches the crucial point of giving evidence and committing to the charge of his listeners of the most important step in this whole process, building up to something, and what is he building up to? We see it, the fifth, the fifth thing, it's not really a word, it's a phrase, verse, uh, uh, verse 3, explaining and giving evidence that, what, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. All right, he's, built, he's now pointing people to Jesus. Listen, the, most, the, the, the only way to give the gospel is to point people to Jesus Christ. That, that, that's where we've got to go. That's the only place that we're, where we can properly end when it comes to doing that. But everything he has said leads to this point. And this is what we call apologetics. Apologetics is the ability to defend the gospel. That's all it is. And note that Paul speaks of the what? The death and the resurrection in the same phrase. We see this over and over again throughout the New Testament. These two events in the life of Christ always go together. The death of Christ defeated sin, but the resurrection of Christ defeated death. And it is one thing to die for the sins of the world, but it is life-changing to rise from the dead. And I've, as I've told you so many times before, it wasn't until the 4th century A.D. that people actually had started having crosses on their churches. For the first 300 years, it wasn't that the cross wasn't important, but what was important was the, res was the uh, resurrection. Okay? And so the death of Christ, what did it do? It removed the wall of division between mankind and God. The death of Christ made it possible for men to no longer be enemies of God. And you know what? Have you ever thought about that phrase being an enemy of God? Whenever we think about enemies, we think of like maybe like equal armies or, you know, some one army having a chance against the other. Listen, when it comes to being an enemy of God, that is a 100% one-sided situation because no man can do nothing against God. Okay, so... Guess what? That's a bad place to be. But the death of Christ removed that barrier because he died for the sins of the world. Then the resurrection of Christ gives us eternal life with him and saves us from what the Bible calls the second death. The second death is the eternal separation from the presence of God in a place called the lake of fire. This is the gospel. All right? And this is what Paul does. This is what he explains to these people. And remember what Titus 3, 4, and 7 says. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, that is Jesus, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out to us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And that, man, that's wonderful news. So here we have, he's giving the gospel to these Jews in the synagogue. Some people believe, some of the Greeks believe, some of the leading women believe. But then we get to the opposition. And we see this in verses 5 through 9. And uh, you know, we're told that certain Jews reject the gospel and become jealous. And honestly, there was a larger part of the city rejected the gospel as opposed to the smaller part that believed it. That's why we... we we're using Thessalonica as an example of rejection of the, of the gospel. But these Jews, they're on negative volition. They have rejected Christ as Savior. They were religious, and as we know, religion is the great enemy of Christianity. Of Christianity. And because of their envy, they take action. And what do they do? They use the mob. Religion oftentimes uses a mob. And here the religious Jews are the ones who hire the mob. 
They literally go to what was called the Agora, which was the marketplace, and they find bums and drifters and convince them to form a mob against Paul and Silas. That's what we're told uh, in, uh, uh, what is it, verse, uh, verse 5, I believe it is. Uh, the Amplified Bible has verse 5 like this. But the unbelieving Jews became jealous and taking some uh, some thugs from the low lowlifes in the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in, uh, in an uproar, and then attacking Jason's house, tried to bring Paul and Silas out to the people. You see, Paul and Silas were friends of Jason. Jason actually, they, he had allowed them to come into his house. He's a believer. He's a Christian. So they hear that Paul and Silas may be there. So they, they hire this mob. They get these guys together, and they go to the house of Jason, but they don't find him. They don't find Paul and Silas there. And so instead, so what they do, uh, we're told, verse 6, when they did not find him, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities. Uh, and when, when it says dragging them, this is what it, what they would do is they beat him first. And after they beat him, they, they literally drag him by their heels. And, and so they drag him by their heels out of the house. After they beat him, they take him out to the city square before the authorities there in Thessalonica. Uh, Lanica, and they make these accusations. It says in verse uh, 7, And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, And there is another king, Jesus. You see, Caesar was worshipped in those days. He was considered a god. And so the people, in fact, as the, as the Roman Caesars, the, the, they just got worse and worse. I forget the name of the first Caesar. His name escapes me. But he was, he was a pretty decent ruler. But the guys that came along after him, they went nuts. They were crazy. You had people like Nero who would set Christians on fire in his garden at night so that he could light his garden. And they, these guys lost their minds. But they considered themselves gods and they demanded worship. And so along comes these Christians and they're worshiping this other king called Jesus. And it says, when it says a king of another kind or another king, the Greek indicates, it, it's, in other words, it's not a human king he's talking about. It's, a, it's, it's, it's supernatural. It's a divine king, of course, that is Christ. And so now they got these people, they got the city all stirred up, they got them in an uproar, and they have them beaten and whatnot. But then, fortunately for Jason, verse 9, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Uh, basically, what they did is they paid them off. Okay, and when they paid them off, they were everything was good, and, and the city officials wise up uh, because guess what? The Romans would not permit the violation of their law, and these city officials were wise enough to realize that this mob activity was contrary to the principle of Roman law. And the sooner they got rid of the mob, the better. Now, there's an interesting fact about Thessalonica. This city was given the status of a free city by the Roman Empire of which there were only about half a dozen outside of Italy that were considered free cities. And uh, Tarsus was one of them, uh, Athens was another one, and Thessalonica. The Romans allowed the cities to choose their own form of government, and they themselves stayed out of it entirely. That was a rare thing for the Romans to do, but that's what they did here. But they still demanded worship of Caesar, you see. But anyway, Thessalonica, they chose what were called politarchs which is translated here, rulers of the city. And this particular title is peculiar to the city of government of Thessalonica at this time. Archaeologists have discovered a marble arch there in that city, which was dated at the time of the reign of Claudius Caesar, who was uh, the Caesar in charge when Paul was in Thessalonica. By this arch, it was discovered that politarchs were ruling the city at that time, and they were named on this arch. There were seven named on this arch, and three of them were friends of Paul. Isn't that amazing? Okay? So these, there's seven guys that are ruling these politarchs in Thessalonica, and three of these guys actually become friends of the Apostle Paul. How do I know this? One is named Sopater of Berea, Acts 20, verse 4. There's a guy named Gaius of Macedonia, Acts 19, 29, and then Secundus, also, Acts chapter 20, verse 4. These same guys' names appeared on this arch where the, where the uh, archaeologists discovered, and these guys were friends of Paul. I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. So here we have the first group of people. 
who with few exceptions have rejected the gospel. But those who did believe were faithful, because we're told in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, see that's what's happening right here, all right? Uh, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. All right? Because remember, First and Thess uh, Second Thessalonians was written uh, to, this, to the church in this city. Next, we move on to the city of Berea, verses 10 through 15. It says, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these uh, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, also they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a, com a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. The phrase in, uh, in uh, where is it, uh, uh, verse 11, the phrase more noble-minded, it's better translated more open-minded. These were Jews in the synagogue in Berea, who had been searching the scriptures, looking for verification of what they had heard. These people had a positive response to the gospel. They heard Paul and Silas preach Christ. They searched the scriptures for themselves and discovered the truth, the truth of what the missionaries have said. Okay? And verse 12 tells us that many of the Jews believed in Christ as Savior, also many men and Gentile women of nobility. The word nobility, as used here, means honorable, reputable, of high standing and influence. So there were some very influential women, perhaps business leaders and, and whatnot, in the city of Thessalonica who, who were uh, placed faith in Christ. Okay? I love the gospel. It good, it's for everybody. It's for the lowest bum on the street to, to the highest guy in a, in, a, in, a in a corporate tower somewhere. So it's for everybody. Okay? Everybody can believe in it. And then in verses 13 and 15, it tells where, where, you know, it talks about the fact that these Jews show up from Thessalonica and begin to agitate the people in Berea. These were known as the Judaizers. These were unsaved Jews who were, they were religious Jews, okay, they, they followed the, the Torah and whatnot, but they would go from city to city wherever Paul went, and they'd come along behind him and try and stir everything up. It would be that way for the rest of his life. So Paul had to learn the principle, it's one that we all need to learn, that the battle is the Lord's. What battle are you facing in life? Give it to God. 1 Samuel 17, 47. And that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You know what a, you know what a conservative person I am. You know I'm about as far right as you can go. I'm a... I'm a Staunch constitutionalists, constitutional originalists. And what I see going on in our country today is absolutely tearing me up. But what I do, I can't fight this battle, but God can. You see, we got to give this to the Lord. And that's what we need to do. That doesn't mean we just sit down and shut up and don't say anything. But when we come across things that we can't control, let God fight it. And that's exactly what Paul did. These guys are chasing him everywhere. He gives it over to God. And God takes care of it. So in contrast to the Jews in Thessalonica and, and the other people who rejected the gospel, the Jews here in Berea and also the Greeks were hungry for and readily accepted the gospel. Two contrasting types of people, believers, and one does and one doesn't. Now we come to the third group of people who do not only, not only do not believe, but they ridicule the gospel. And it has been my personal experience that the more intellectual a person is, the more difficulty they have with faith. You ever run across people like that? All right? The more, the smarter they are up here, I don't know how else to say this, the smarter they are up here, the devil they are here. Okay? And, and so this is what Paul runs into in Athens. So let's read verses 16 through 21, because that's as far as we're going to go this morning. 
He says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? And others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Europeus, saying, May you know what this new teaching is, uh, which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And so that's, uh, so that's as far as we're going to get this morning. The beginning of verse 22 is Paul's response, but I'm not going to go there today. Verses 16 through 18. Paul arrives in Athens, and as he walks around the city, he sees idols and idol worship everywhere he goes. In fact, he, it, it, what this does, it prompts him to anger. That word, his spirit was being provoked. He was experiencing righteous anger in his spirit. Because all this, and it was directed not towards the people, it was directed towards the idols and the idol worship and all the false doctrine and teaching that was going on around him. So what does he do? He decides to do something about it. For several days, we're told in verse 17, he walks around the city preaching the gospel. To do this in Athens at that time was to attract the attention of the two main schools of philosophy, which were the Epicureans and the Stoics. Okay? Paul was, in essence, putting himself and therefore Christianity on trial. For in Athens... When a new teaching entered the city, if enough people heard it, then the person preaching that had to defend what he was saying. Okay? And this is exactly what Paul wants to happen. So he runs around everywhere he goes, giving the gospel, telling people about Jesus, talking about the resurrection. And now he's starting to create a stir, and he gets enough people's attention to where it attracts the Epicureans and the Stoics who were kind of in charge, so to speak, at that time. And so, guess what? He's got to be put on trial, which means you've got to answer for all these claims that you're making. And Paul's like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted to happen. Now, who were these philosophies, these schools? The Epicureans. They were founded by a guy named Epicurus. The Epicureans were materialists, and they were atheists. And their goal in life was pleasure. To some, this pleasure meant that which was grossly physical, just pure physical pleasure. That's what it meant to some of them. To others, it meant, it meant a life of refined serenity, free from pain and anxiety. And the true Epicurean avoided extremes and sought to enjoy life by keeping things in balance. But pleasure was still his number one goal. That was one school of philosophy that was very popular in Athens. The other one that's mentioned here is the Stoics. These guys, or this, this school, was founded by a guy named Zeno. His name comes from the Greek word stoa, which means porch. So Zeno taught on the porch of the various temples, and those who became his adherents of his system were called porch people, or Stoics. They were pantheists, which means they worshipped many gods. And their emphasis was on personal discipline and self-control. Pleasure was not good and pain was not evil. See, that's just the opposite of the Epicureans. The Epicureans, it was all about pleasure to the Stoics, though that was not good. Pleasure is not good and even uh, pain is not evil. Right? The most important thing in life was to follow one's reason and be self-sufficient. Unmoved by inner feelings or outward circumstances, of course, uh, such a philosophy only fanned the flames uh, of arrogance, all right? And it only made a person more self-reliant. You only, you always heard the term, he looks very stoic, right? It comes from. So this was the other school of philosophy. So they call Paul, in verse 18, an idle bobbler, which literally means a seed picker. And this was a term of sarcastic derision. The seed pickers were the small birds that were everywhere picking seeds out of the trash. Yeah, we've all seen the little tiny birds that go around anywhere. That's what that's what they're calling Paul. He, he's, a, he's an idol. He's an idol babbler. And this new teaching he was proclaiming was, guess what? Jesus and the resurrection. There it is again. It's not Jesus and the cross. Not that the cross is not important. It's Jesus and the resurrection. 
guarantee that he talked about the cross as well. But the emphasis is on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So what did they do? They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, and which means that they seized him by force and took him uh, up to this place. Now, the, the Areopagus, the courtroom located on Mars Hill. Mars was the god of war, right? And so you had this hill called Mars Hill, and at the top of the hill there was a temple dedicated to the god of war, Mars. Well, about halfway down, uh, as you go down this hill, about, excuse me, about halfway down, there was a courtroom that was carved out of rock. This is where Socrates was condemned to death in this courtroom. And then as you go on down to the bottom of the hill, there's another a temple to the Furies. If you remember any of your, your mythology, the Furies are those, those, those devil flying demon things or whatever. No, they, they call them the Furies. And everybody who was in Athens was terrified of the Furies. So you had these two temples and you had this courtroom halfway down carved out of rock. Well, the Areopagus, it was the courtroom, and so they take him, Paul, and, and, the, and they take him to this place, and they say, okay, tell us about this, this new belief that you're talking about. Okay? Uh, and notice as well, verse 21 tells us that the people of Athens, they would spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Can you imagine living like that, just looking for something new? The American moral and socialist philosopher, or social philosopher, Eric Hoffer, he said this, the fear of becoming a has-been keeps some people from becoming anything. Okay? And so, you know, when you're always looking for something new, well, iPhones, good grief, they come out every two months, it seems like. Always looking for the newest thing. That's where these people were. They're always looking for the newest teaching. Obviously, they weren't iPhones, but they were looking for the newest teaching, the newest thing to come along. And so that's what they did. The person who chases the new and ignores the old soon discovers that he has no deep roots to nourish his life. And so he also discovers that nothing is really new. It's just that our memories are poor. We do not have time, as I said. I don't want to get into, because beginning of verse 22, to, uh, through the end of the chapter, is the message that Paul gives at the Areopagus in response to uh, when he's put on trial. Okay, And those verses are absolutely loaded with some very important, very good doctrine. So I want to spend time there, and I don't want to rush through it. So we'll start there next time. But just understand, Thessalonica has rejected the gospel, Berea has believed the gospel, and now we come to Athens, and we're going to see that they will ridicule. We've already seen it. They ridicule the gospel. And we'll see as well when we get into Paul's response that they continue to ridicule the gospel. Only some of them will place faith in Christ. All right, the last few minutes, I told you we're going to look at the doctrine of the crooked stick. Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And the reason I want to do this this morning, since Paul has run headlong into human philosophy and human knowledge, it is good to end this morning looking at a brief section that addresses human knowledge and philosophy. Human philosophy or human knowledge that leaves God out is simply another form of religion. And man, which is man by his own efforts trying to please God. That's all religion is. Ecclesiastes, right after the book of Proverbs. 12 chapters long, it's one of the greatest books in the, in the Bible. It's one of my favorites. A lot of people see it as a, as a kind of an eeyore type book, kind of a sad or kind of a, a you know, put you down type thing. That's not it at all. The book is incredible. But I just want to look at a couple of things. Think about the philosopher. Think about the Stoics. Think about the Epicureans and the things that they believe. They're atheists, right? They don't believe in God. They're Epicureans. Then you got these pantheists and the way they believe. And, and, and as far as the atheist goes, I want, I'm going to look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible. It says, He, that is God, has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet man cannot find out, comprehend, or grasp what God has done, his overall plan from the beginning to the end. The atheist is longing for God even though he doesn't believe in him. That's exactly what that verse means. God has put eternity in every man's heart. Go back to chapter 1, verse 9. 
These people in Athens are constantly looking for something new, right? Look at, look at verse 9. That which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Now this was written by Solomon, what, two, a thousand years ago? Or what, no, three thousand years ago? Something like that? You know, and you can easily say, well, that, you know, this is three thousand years from then. It doesn't need to think. There are nothing to listen. When it comes to the things that matter, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing ever, you know, nothing ever changes. Then look, drop down to verses 12 through 18. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my mind to sink and, uh, seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. Uh, it is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, which means a vapor, and striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. So now we come to the doctrine of the crooked stick. Uh, look at verse 15, as I just said, read it again. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Flip over a couple, a couple of chapters to chapter 7. It goes right along with this same topic. Chapter 7, verses 13 and, uh, 13 and 14. It says, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has been? In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. Doctrine of the crooked stick, five points and we're done. Number one, God throws into everybody's life a crooked stick. An adverse situation or an adverse circumstance. Number two, you cannot change it, but you can use it to grow. Okay? Can't change it, but you can use it to grow. Number three, the object is to make us strong out of weakness. That's why those things come into our lives. Number four, when God throws you a crooked stick, be like a good dog and bring it back to him. He will turn it into blessing in accordance with his plan. And number five, the, the Bible is full of examples of believers whose lives were blessed through adverse conditions God permitted in their lives, all for his glory. Seek God's glory in whatever the situation is. There's people in this there's people in this congregation that have been through hell. I know it. We all have been through hell of some sort or another, some of us worse than others. But we gotta understand that God's in control. Uh, uh, well I'm not gonna get into I'll just that prayer request that I mentioned at the beginning of service. That has to that has to do with somebody that's been through hell. Okay? That's all I'm gonna say about that. But anyway, I want to encourage you. I wanted, uh, that's why I wanted to come here. I wanted to end here. When we look at all these, these people in Athens, they're searching for something new. They're looking for answers. And the only place you can find it is in a personal relationship with Christ. All right. Thank you for your time. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, the situations in life that you've led us through. I thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would all learn to focus and concentrate and keep him first. We would all seek to bring uh, all the glory to your name. Uh, and I just uh, pray that you be with each of us as we go our separate ways and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>